Today we're going to be finishing up chapter 3 of Colossians and just starting out the first verse of chapter 4. Um, but in this section, um, we're going to address the issues of slavery and slaves and masters. And this would have been a normal part of the household, um, the, the common household in the Roman and Greek worlds um, in Paul's day. And so what I want to do is I want to start by saying right up front that in this passage, Paul <clears throat> is in no way endorsing the institution of slavery, of course. Um, slavery is unjust in uh, our day, just as it was in Paul's day. Um, but what Paul's doing is speaking into the reality of the world in which he lived and in which his listeners lived. The reality is that some of the people that would have heard this letter being read in the church in Colossae would have been slaves and others would have been masters of slaves. And so Paul's addressing the um, Roman household of his day. Um, <clears throat> But we ask, why didn't Paul um, just demand that the institution of slavery be ended? And, and I think the answer to that is that Paul, um, in his day and in his ministry, was not given a mandate to overthrow the, injust, the unjust systems of this world. There were other uh, systems and institutions in the Roman world that were incredibly unjust. Um, but Paul wasn't given a mandate to do that. What Paul was given from Jesus was a stewardship. And he actually speaks about that in the first chapter when he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I'm filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship given to me from God for you to make the word of God fully known. He said the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to the saints. To them he chose to make known among the Gentiles how great is, are the riches of the, the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Of him, and he says, it's him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And he says, for this I toil, struggling with all the energy which he so powerfully works within me. So Paul's stewardship when, from God <clears throat> was to make the word of God fully known, the mystery of Christ in them, the hope of glory, and to present them fully mature in Christ. That was his stewardship. And so what Paul's doing is he's, through this epistle, he, he's saying, listen, let me show you who Jesus truly is. He's the creator of all things, the sustainer of the entire universe, all energy and matter and space and time and all spirit is under his domain in his control he's the creator of all of them and he sustains them by the word of his power let me show you what he's done for you okay he, he all the record of our debt that stood against us was nailed to the cross in him and paid fully by his blood he's he's given to us his righteousness and taken upon himself our own sin he's reconciled us to god the father by his blood Okay, and, and then how should we live in light of all of these things that we've just learned? How should we live on this earth? And his message to us is, look, <clears throat> you've died in Christ. If you've been buried within him, baptism and raised up by the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead. If, if you've been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, that, then, then you shouldn't have to focus on the things of this earth. In other words, in Christ, um, you aren't defined by, by the accomplishments of this earth. Your identity is not in your earthly status. It's not in your achievements and the things that you accomplish on this earth you're not simply the sum of your achievements and your accomplishments and the stack of money or the legacy you leave on this earth and that your citizenship is not in this world even peter said i i urge you as exiles and sojourners right to not to not um to abstain from the passions of the flesh okay but he says um he says again you know he's delivered us God the Father has delivered us in Christ from the domain, from the control, from the power of the enemy. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and that we belong fully to him now. In fact, there's another passage um, where he says, you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, okay, Christ is our very life. He is the only one, the only thing that we should be living for in this life and on this earth. And so earthly status, earthly achievements. Paul, Paul says, look, whatever status you had when you came to Christ, just 
continue in it. Were, were you were you circumcised when you when you were called? Then then don't seek to be uncircumcised. Were you uncircumcised? Don't seek to become circumcised. Were you a bond servant when you were called? Don't don't worry about it. If you can gain your freedom, by all means gain it. But, but don't worry about it. Don't make this the focus of your life. Instead, in the very place where he called you, live for him. And this is the message of Colossians. This is the message of this passage. Live for Christ. In whatever situation you find yourself in this life, in whatever station you find yourself in this life, live for Christ. Because Christ himself is your life. There is no other thing. There is no other purpose. There's no, no other calling. Um, there's nothing else that measures up and there's nothing else by which you should be identified or called or defined by in this life. And so take this context into this passage um, where Paul is addressing bond servants and their masters in Colossians chapter 3. And really it's just not about slavery. Because see, there was a, there was a bigger... Uh, darker uh, kingdom than the kingdom of Rome and, and Christ didn't come to overthrow the kingdom and institutions of Rome. Christ came to overthrow a darker, more insidious, more powerful kingdom, the kingdom of darkness that reigned through sin and death upon this earth. Christ came as light into the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it, right? And, and so Christ came and conquered darkness. He put them to open shame, triumphing. God the Father triumphed over the, the principalities and powers in Christ. Okay, and so Christ came and overthrew that kingdom of Satan and death and sin and came and gave life. And now those of us who've been transferred into this new kingdom, the kingdom of the beloved son, who've received the redemption, the forgiveness of sins in Christ, those of us who've tasted of this new creation life, this deliverance from evil and sin and death and this peace and reconciliation with God the Father, now we can live in the midst of whatever situation we may find ourselves on this earth in this dark world, okay? And so Paul's speaking in to the Christian household and he's saying, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives in this self-sacrificial way and don't be bitter toward them and children obey your parents in everything for this pleases the lord and parents fathers don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged and and he says bond servants he addresses bond servants he says in verse 22 obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. This word for masters is kurios. It means Lord. It's the same word the disciples used for Jesus um, in his earthly ministry. They said master. They said kurios. But he says bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters or lords is another way we could say that. And the, the word Lord would be a lowercase l, okay? Those who are your earthly lords, your earthly masters with a lowercase l or a lowercase m. He says not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, okay? In other words, don't just do it when they're looking. And that, so so these principles apply to the bond servant, the slave um, in the Roman world, but but they also apply to you and to me in, in our relationships, employee and employer, okay? The principle is the same. He says, bond servants, okay? Slaves, okay? Employees, okay? Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, those who have authority over you in this world, okay? Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, okay? So he's saying not as just when they're looking, you know, you're doing it for um, show. Outwardly, you're pretending like you're you're for them and that you're in their corner, but inwardly, you really are, are You would if you could and if you can, if you have the opportunity, you seek to undermine them. You're speaking bad about them behind their back. You're not working hard at all. You're dragging your feet. There, there's a philosophy in the world right now. Um, for a while, it was kind of a big thing. Quiet quitting is one way that they referred to it. But basically, that in my job, I'm going to do the bare minimum. Minimum. Only what I'm actually like required to the letter to do and not one single thing more. I won't lift one little finger to do one more thing than what I'm called. I'm not going to stay one minute extra to try to help advance the cause of the company for which I work for. I'm going to just barely do the bare minimum. Okay. And, and, and this philosophy, um, what Paul's telling us right now is this is anti-Christ. It's anti-Christian. 
this anti-kingdom that he's telling us what you need to do employees bond servants whoever you are obey in everything your earthly um supervisor your earthly master he says not by way of eye service as people pleasers not just when they're looking not just trying to gain a curry favor for yourself so i can get a promotion or a raise or so they'll finally pay me what i'm worth or whatever it is whatever your motivation he says no but with sincerity of heart fearing the lord Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians, okay? He said, whether I, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. No matter what it is, do everything to the glory of God. He says, give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God. He says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, okay? We said right here, don't, don't do people pleasing, okay? But what Paul means is something different. I try to please everyone in everything I do. He said, not seeking my own advantage, okay? The point of it is not to seek your own advantage. It's not to seek like what's good for you. I better look busy because the boss is watching, but the second he turns away, I'm gonna do something different. He says, but in sincerity of heart, okay? But in 1 Corinthians here, he says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. And so Paul's motivation in this and the motivation of the bond servant in this passage or the employee in the 21st century, <clears throat> obey in every way your earthly supervisor, your authority, your master, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, um, not seeking your own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Okay. He says in sincerity of heart in this passage, fearing the Lord. And now this is the word kurios again. And this is the word kurios with a capital K. Okay, this is Lord with a capital L. This is a master with a capital M. This is God. This is Jesus, okay? Bond servants obey everything <clears throat> in everything. Those who are your earthly little K kurios, not by way of eye service as ple people pleasers, but having a genuine concern in your heart, working genuinely for what's the, the betterment of the company you work for or the master you serve. He says, um, fearing the Lord God, okay? That your motivation is to please him. And this goes right back to what Paul prayed in the first chapter. He said, since the day we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, we've not seek, ceased to pray for you, asking that you be filled with the, the, with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, that you'd live your life in such a way that it pleases the Lord, that it's worthy of him, and the way that he lived and died for you and gave himself for you in a self-sacrificial way. He says, whatever you do in verse 23, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive your inheritance as your reward, the inheritance. And so your motivation on this earth is not for the things of this earth. It's not for the respect of your supervisor. Like he better respect me because he doesn't know who I am and, and I won't be treated this way. No, that, that you humble yourself just as Christ came as a humble servant and that you work for the genuine, sincere blessing of the people who are over you, not for them, but for the sake of the Lord, fearing him and knowing that it's not the raise and the promotion and whatever else is coming your way that you're working for. That's not your motivation. Knowing that you're going to receive already the inheritance because you've been adopted as a child of God and you're not a citizen of this world anyway. And the purpose of this life is not to accumulate blessing and respect and things. It's to work and serve the Lord for his cause that the people around us might also come to know him and join him in the eternal kingdom of the Son. That they might be delivered also from the dominion of darkness in their own lives and in this world and be transferred to citizenship in the kingdom of the beloved Son. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will re receive the inheritance as your reward. He says, you are serving, making it more explicit. You are serving the Lord Christ. Okay. You might have a job with a, with a really jerky boss. You might be a bond servant in the first century and your master is horrible to you. Okay. But, but remember that you are serving the Lord Christ. You're not serving them. You're serving him by being faithful where he has placed you and where you are in this moment. And knowing that you may not always be in that situation, for, but for the moment you're here now and you're faithful where he has planted you. He says, for the wrongdoer will be repaid back for the wrong he has done and there's no partiality. This reminds me of that parable of the talents, right? He gave 10 talents to one, five talents to another, and just one talent to another one. And, and, and those who, who took the talents and invested them and the master came back and they gave them back with, with more, right? With interest. And the final one, he says, I just buried it. I didn't do anything with it. And he says, you know, take that talent from him, give it to the one with 10 and, and punish this servant, okay? because he was unfaithful with, with what God had, with what the master had entrusted to him. The, the master has entrusted you and me with the stewardship of the, of the people and the positions and the, the, the responsibilities he's given us in the, in the world in which we live right this moment. 
Whatever the situation is you find yourself in, live for Christ. This world's not your home anyway. Live for Christ. And he goes to the master now. He says, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The master is accountable to the Lord. There will be a day of judgment in which each one of us will stand before the king and give an answer for the things that we've done and that we've said in this life, okay? And so if you do not receive justice in this world, justice will come in the kingdom. But in this world, honestly, the thing that we shouldn't be asking for is justice. We should be asking for grace and mercy because none of us deserve the grace and the mercy and the salvation and the love of the God that saved us and gave his only son for us, okay? And so this, this motivation is that we live for Christ alone in this life, not for ourselves, not for any other cause, not for any other thing. We don't make any other thing the hill we die on, aside from Calvary, because Jesus said, if you wanna come after me, you gotta take up your cross and you have to follow after me. And where Christ was going with his cross was Calvary, to be crucified and to die, to lay down his life for others. That's the exact call that's on our life as well to follow him into death and also into eternal life. So that wraps up chapter three. We'll move on to the next video.